Welcome everyone to another remote uh, condensed matter seminar. Uh, today, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Johnson Goh. Uh, Johnson is group leader for the quantum materials and devices group uh, over at the Institute of Materials Research and Engineering in ASTAR here in Singapore. He's also the uh, investigator for Valleytronics and Spin Valley Qubits. Uh, Johnson obtained his PhD in 2007 from the ARC Center of Excellence for Quantum Computation and Communication Technology at uh, UNSW in Sydney, uh, where he worked towards developing uh, spin qubits in silicon. Um, and uh, as a matter of fact, Johnson just added the finishing touches to his PhD thesis uh, when I first joined the group in 2006. So we've known each other for a couple of years. Uh, he then returned to Singapore and his current research interest lies in uh, quantum computation, quantum transport and quantum AI and all of those, uh, I guess, implemented in novel classes of materials, uh, amongst them those uh, atomically thin uh, semiconductors that he'll be uh, talking about today. And uh, yeah, with this, Johnson, I would suggest I'll hand over to you. All right, thanks, Ben. And, uh... Good morning, everyone, and thank you for your kind introduction and for all of you uh, coming to this uh, seminar. Now, it's my pleasure to share with you some of our work uh, on engineering spin valley qubits in 2D semiconductors this morning. So this is uh, the brief agenda. Um, I do not intend this talk to be uh, too technical, so um, I understand there's a broad audience, and uh, I'd like to share with you first our motivation for the work and describe the challenges that we face in doing this work, dive into the capabilities that we've built over the last four years, and show you some of our recent progress. All right. Now, I'd like to especially talk about um, what it takes to build a scalable set of physical qubits for quantum computing rather than quantum computing itself. This is because there are possibly already hundreds of uh, online videos about quantum computing, uh, computing. And so if you are new to this topic, a quick search on Google could find you some excellent introductions. So for example, this one that I put up here on the right, there's a YouTube video that attempts to explain quantum computing to audiences at five different levels, starting from the level of a child. Right, so take a snapshot of this uh, if you find this to be useful. But now let me begin with the motivation for our work. Right, the advent of uh, quantum theory gave us not only a new way to describe our world more carefully, it also gifted us with uh, new resources for technology innovation. So resources such as discrete energy levels, the more esoteric quantum tunneling, the mind-boggling superpositions and entanglement are all well heard and taught in many courses both at the high school level as well as undergraduate levels. Now loosely, we refer to the development of quantum theory and the exploitation of these discrete energies and tunneling in various technologies as the first quantum revolution. And from this, we gain new technologies such as the laser, the microchip, the MRI, GPS, and all of which have direct impact on our lives today. Now, some of the icons that you see below here are very familiar to you. They don't even need to be introduced or labeled. Now, these are just a sampling of the com different companies that we know so well today that critically rely on that quantum backbone from the first revolution. Now, while we have gained so much already from the first quantum revolution, it would be remiss to not tap on the resources of superposition as well as entanglement. This is because of their potential for more precise measurements, for sensing, 
for more secure communications, much larger computational space that exceeds even the number of atoms in our universe. And hence the second revolution, which began around the end of the last century, calls both superposition and entanglement to task. Now with these many different uh, potential disruptions in technology that we anticipate, so in this talk, I want to focus uh, mainly on the audacious goal of realizing a universal quantum computer, which perhaps is still decades away. But the timeline may be even longer if the necessary research does not get started today. Now, by some estimates, the market for quantum computing alone but amongst many other quantum technologies, is estimated to exceed a modest 2 billion by 2025. And I think this is probably on the low end of the estimates. As a result, we see many countries rushing in to invest in quantum uh, engineering, quantum computing, particularly the US, the UK, those countries in the EU, China, India, Australia, Israel, these are countries that have made significant national investment in quantum computing and related technologies in recent times. And you must have also read in the news quite frequently in the last couple of months, uh, probably over the last two years, as uh, big companies like Google, IBM, Intel, Honeywell, race towards what is known as quantum supremacy. Now, what are the opportunities in this space for Singapore? Now, with quantum, the exponential speed up in computational power promises to impact many fields that range from quantum chemistry to optimization problems. These, in turn, find applications in agriculture, precision medicine, finance, transport routing, communications, and military applications. And here are some examples of the various agencies and organizations in Singapore that could benefit from quantum computing. So how do we harness the quantum uh, progress that we see uh, for computational advantage? The team from Google provided uh, this very helpful schematic about two years back to explain what we must do. So in order to have useful quantum computing, you really need to go into this region that's in green. So this green zone, what does it mean? But it means that a quantum computer needs to have at least a million bits of information handling capability. And so in the jargon of quantum computing, these are known as qubits. You need to have about a million qubits or more. In addition, we need them to perform with more than 99% fidelity or reliability. And this should hopefully allow us to perform sufficient operations before we hit an error that needs to be corrected. So where are we now on this chart? Now this circle represents roughly where we stand today even with the 50-odd qubits that has been reported by IBM and Google. But you might ask, right, today we have more than a bit, 10 billion transistors within our cell phones right, that you hold in your pocket. Why can't we have a million qubits? Well, that's a very interesting question, and uh, we need to go back a bit in technology in terms of, in, in order to understand why this might be so. So not so much a physics problem, because uh, qubits now exist, but engineering-wise and technology-wise, I think there's still a big gap. Right, this is a state-of-the-art uh, quantum computer with less than 100 qubits. And already, as you can see, the mass of wires supporting electronics 
that need to be hooked up to run the qubits are essentially occupying an entire room. Now, if you want to scale this up to a million qubits, right, it might be quite challenging with technologies that we have today. So a recent report that um, you find uh, from GovTech says, right, there is as yet no scalable commercial grade quantum computers, right? Despite the claims uh, by IBM or Google or even IonQ. Now to reach a million qubits, various material challenges need to be overcome and material quality control at the atomic level may be required. In addition, we need circuits that will work at deep cryogenic temperatures, and these are typically needed for several promising solid state qubits. If you think about this, this is reminiscent of the development of the microcomputer. And if you remember from history, the first ENIAC was this clunky big system that occupied an entire room because it was based on easy to get off the shelf vacuum tubes, which were sort of mature technologies at that time. Now it took the development of the transistor and also many new material breakthroughs in order to get to the integrated circuits and eventually the microchips that we carry in our pockets. Now, how does this look like for quantum computing? This is how it looks. And at first glance, looks like a deja vu, right? Indeed, the state of the art IBM Q currently fills a full room as well. And while there are several physical qubit options now available, it is anyone's guess whether any of these will eventually become the staple qubits for industry. So between now and then, history quite strongly is hinting to us that new material breakthroughs are urgently needed. So at least here for you some industry pain points uh, that are faced by hardware man manufacturers. I, I roughly categorize them into two groups, one having to do with uh, materials and another group having to do with uh, the electronics that's required to control the cube. Now, if we take the cue from uh, the semicon industry, and this is what ASTAR did when we decide to embark on this journey, uh, it looks like solid state qubits are perhaps the most uh, rational way to go if we want to engineer um, qubits for the future. So here are some uh, options for solid state qubits. And these are yeah, still um, options that are in contention. Uh, essentially, these are based on quantum dots, or um, which can be electrostatically uh, formed, or quantum dots that are based on defects uh, in semiconductors. And these are quite popular. And in more recent times, with uh, the rise of 2D material, we also find people trying to make quantum dots in graphene, as well. Now, challenge for us is to develop a solid state material system that could potentially host uh, qubits and address the material pain points that I have listed earlier. Now, along with the uh, wonder material known as graphene came this interesting family of 2D semiconductors known as the TMDCs or transition matter by calcogenite. Right, they're largely semiconducting in nature and they have large spin orbits splitting at the band edges due to the heavy transition metal atom. Now, in addition, the stable H phase of these crystals right, possess inversion symmetry breaking and this results in a unique spin valley coupling where, for example, the blue down spins in this um, schematic of the band diagram you see here, 
right? The blue down spins can only reside in the blue k value, and the red up spins can only reside in the uh, opposite k prime value. Now this is thought to suppress scattering as moving a spin from the k to k prime value will necessitate the energy for a spin flip. Such uh, valley coupled spins are also called valley pseudo spins, and valley coupling is thought to be advantageous for prolonging spin coherence lifetimes. How do we control or access these valley pseudo spins? Now, theorists have uh, proposed that this spin valley locking that we find in the opposite valleys right, provides the handle for us to access the valleys since we know how to couple spins to external fields very well. Spe specifically, right, the spin valley locking results in the barrier curvatures of opposite signs, right, which are linked to the orbital magnetic moments um, and also to optical circular dichroism. Right. And crucially, this spin valley locking intrinsically found in these materials, right, the TMDCs, allows for selection rules. Right. In this case, optical selection rules, which can independently, independently address the valleys based on the circular polarization of light. In addition, you find that uh, you also get uh, contrast in the magnetic moment, which gives the valley uh, Zeeman effect, which is detectable as the breaking of degeneracy between the K and the K prime value. And finally, we also get the valley hole effect, which is due to the opposite very curvatures, and this is detectable as an anomalous velocity of uh, spins perpendicular to the direction of an in-plane electric field. Now in this uh, white paper that we put together in 2017 uh, in a workshop at MIT, four key motivations for electronics were laid down. And amongst these, right, you see in the last point here, the valley coupled spin qubits with long coherence times uh, are expected, which could operate at higher temperatures, perhaps. Right. So as a result of these uh, interests, a number of theoretical proposals uh, can be found now right, for building spin valley qubit uh, in such TMDC semiconductors. And here are at least uh, three references. And if you can, uh, you are interested in the details, you can look up these uh, three references. Now, for our project, we aim to demonstrate the first spin valley qubits made in 2D TMDCs using a scalable technique. And so, the unique spin valley coupling, right, is expected to produce more robust qubit. Now, in addition, because of the strong spin orbit interactions, we also expect to find uh, fast gate operations as well. So the strategy is to exploit these uh, advantages in 2D TMDCs by electrically forming quantum dots, which will host the valley protected spin qubits. So how do we build these things? Right, firstly, you need to grow large area, high quality TMDCs on a suitable substrate. And then you make good contacts to these TMDC materials, protect them with a suitable dielectric, and finally, you put down gate electrodes by lithography to complete the device. Right, sounds very easy, but there are many challenges in each of those steps. So much of what I will share with you has been reported in this recent paper, so feel free to take a screenshot if you are interested to find out more. Okay, um, first we want to go into uh, materials development a bit. And the first step towards our engineering of these qubits would be to find a consistent supply of good quality TMDC materials. And those of you who 
have not been working in the field of uh, 2D materials may not be aware, but uh, it is indeed a very challenging task to find good source or good supplier for consistent quality or consistently high quality PMDC materials. Now we chose standard CVD as the main growth technology due to its compatibility for scaling. But apart from that, nothing much else is standard. Right? We need to target wafer scale, homogeneous growth, large grain size, and hopefully the grains are well oriented for scalable lithography. Now there are no standard recipes yet, and hence significant development has to be undertaken by our team. Now we benchmark our grown materials against the best uh, reported by companies such as IMAC and TSMC. And here I'm happy to report that the current state of the art growth for our WS2 material right, in mono layer form consists, consistently shows uh, PL line widths that are <coughs> narrower than those reported by either company. So PL here stands for photoluminescence, which is a technique we use to screen our materials. Now this indicates the high level of uniformity we can achieve within the um, crystals that we grow and hence the quality that we have. Now even when we compare this to exfoliated material that you see here on the right uh, view graph, we find that our uh, material quality is generally better. So this gives us uh, hope that we uh, have the right material or at least material that has good enough quality to build our qubits on. Right, this is another result that we recently attained. Um, we, in the addition to uh, trying to grow uh, large grains, right, we have also been trying to uh, orientate the grains as they grow so that uh, you achieve both size as well as orientation. And this has been very challenging for the community as shown by the previous works uh, in this view graph. Typically, when you try to achieve growth orientation, you compromise on the size of the grains. Right? In our work, we have been able to maintain our crystals of around 100 microns in size while maintaining uh, a good orientation so that uh, when it comes to making devices, you know that you have uh, grains on the, the wafer or on the substrate that are roughly oriented in the same direction. Right? This will help in terms of lithography uh, for scaling up. Now once we have these materials, it is important to carefully characterize them, ensure that they possess the desirable qualities that we need or we want to have, right? like the spin valley coupling, minimal charge disorder, good homogeneity, good coupling to context, etc. Now for this, we took about two years to develop this set of uh, screening tools you see here. Essentially, it consists of uh, three systems. Uh, the first one is a um, angle resolve photo emission spectroscopy system, which also has a spin resolution capability. And this is useful for band structure mapping to look at our materials. Um, the second system is the optoelectronic cryostat system, which we uh, use mainly for our circular dichroic PL measurements and also some curl rotation measurements. And finally, at the bottom here, we have a set of scanning tunneling microscopes, which are useful for atomic resolution characterization of our materials. Now these tools provide the list of techniques uh, that we um, have over here right in the middle, which allows us to look at the materials, screen them before we spend precious time fabricating devices on the material. Now a quick brief on uh, the RPS or the spin RPS system right uh, here. Uh, essentially, you map band structures uh, with this system, and I think most people know about this. 
In addition to that, uh, we are able to do line shape analysis on these uh, uh, spectra. And this provides us an indication, for example, of carrier lifetime. And finally, this uh, method also allows us to detect the spin valley coupling effects in the topmost layer right, of the TMDC uh, that we put on the substrate. Now we have next the uh, optoelectronics cryostat, which is our workhorse for a range of optical cry uh, characterizations such as PL, curl rotation mapping, and also some basic electrical transport me measurements in C2 uh, so that we can look at the material quality and also have a quick assessment of their electrical quality initially. Now this allows the characterization of our samples also from uh, temperature ranging from 450 Kelvin down to 3 Kelvin. Now our capabilities for scanning tunneling microscopy or STM right, is a suite of two systems. The first one is a low temperature STM that allows for atomic resolution imaging spectroscopy studies at around 4K. And the other one is a 4 nanoprobe system that has been customized so that we can also do ballistic electron emission microscopy or beam in short. And this is for the local probing of materials interfaces. Finally, we have a two state of the art blue force dilution refrigerators, which allow for quantum measurement experiments down to a few tens of millikelvin. And these are also equipped with 3D vector magnets for magneto transport measurements. Okay, let me finally come to this part where we uh, share with you the recent progress for device fabrication uh, towards making top gated quantum dots in these 2D uh, TMDC materials. Now, the main issues that we have had to tackle to build these devices are initially contact engineering. Um, we also look at nano etching of these materials uh, to see if it's possible to attain uh, quantum confinement by that way. And of course, we need to uh, engineer the dielectrics that go onto this material in order to do gating. So one of the basic requirements for all devices is to make efficient connections to the outside world. So this is no different for building qubits. A major challenge here is to make good ohmic contacts. So hi, here I show you the view graphs of an example of ohmic contacts that appear to be good at room temperature, but when you cool it down to 20 millikelvin, suddenly it becomes non-ohmic. And this often happens, and it's actually no good uh, uh, if we have these contacts for our quantum devices. So in this recent work, we uh, collaborated with uh, Professor Manish Chawala from uh, Cambridge to employ a special indium alloy contact strategy. And we also have Professor Ricky Young from uh, his team from SUTD to provide the computational support for this work. Now we find that uh, with this uh, indium alloy contact uh, that we use, we are able to go down to contact resistivities of the order of a few tens of kilo ohms, but right, and very, very small uh, shocky barriers of only a few milli EVs um, that you see here. Uh, importantly, this kind of a contact quality persisted from room temperature all the way down to 3 Kelvin, as you see in this middle view, view graph here. And this enabled our observation of uh, what we believe to be resonant handling right, at low temperature, 3 Kelvin. And so to our knowledge, this is the first demonstration of such stable contacts. And this marks a milestone for our device engineering efforts. Now, apart from efficient contacts for charge injection, we also need an effective way to electrically gate the uh, TMDC materials, and for this we need to overgrow the TMDC material with a suitable dielectric, and then use lithography to pattern metal gates on top, and with a suitable application of the gate voltages, we can then selectively create regions of 
charge accumulation to form the dots and regions of depletion to separate the dots. And here we demonstrate recent progress uh, in building such electrically gated quantum dots for hosting our qubits. The first step is to show the ability to pinch off the soft strain current with the gates and this demonstrates full gate control over charge accumulation and depletion as we show here on the right. And then we, once we um, have these gates working, we attempt to confine a dot with, for example, the gate structure that you see here on the left. Now, if a dot is successfully formed, then we see the trademark Coulomb blockade diamond via differential conductance map as depicted here in the middle. Now we've also considered the alternative scheme to reduce the number of gates required to form these dots by um, using uh, ribbons that are first etch uh, down to from 2D uh, from 2D material to become 1D conductors or semiconductors. So this is uh, in contrast to what I showed you earlier where um, we use only metal gates on top to create the quantum dots. Here, we hope that the physical etching will create already one dimension of confinement, and perhaps that could reduce the number of gates eventually in our architecture. Right, this is a very preliminary work, but here we've shown that uh, while we were trying to etch the ribbons, occasionally we find some accidentally formed quantum dots, which are of the size of a few tens of nanometers, and so again, you find this trademark Coulomb blockade um, diamonds here. Right? So this work is ongoing, uh, and it remains to be seen if this method could eventually be viable. Right, let me uh, conclude my talk by giving you a brief glance of our roadmap, right? and um, to show you how far we've come and where we need to go next in our quest to build the first spin valley qubit. This line uh, in red right, uh, marks where we are today. And so today we have in ASTAR a comprehensive facility for the development of the spin valley qubits. I've shown you some of the initial devices demonstrating the feasibility of electrical gate control for forming quantum dots which will host our qubits, hopefully. And also, I've shown you our ability to characterize the dots and also the materials that we use. Right? Now, in parallel, uh, we have had to devote quite a significant amount of time to materials engineering. And uh, this is uh, what I explained in my introduction as a critical next step for qubit technology. Now, all these are summarized in uh, our recent publications. And we now have uh, centimeter scale PMDC materials. And we are poised to build you know, our first qubit, hopefully, in uh, the next year or two. Yeah. Now, there are, of course, still a multitude of research and developmental issues to overcome. And a large part of it lies in material development. Right. Particularly for materials, we need to up the TMDC quality and reduce charge defects by at least an order of magnitude or more. And this involves optimizing both the growth as well as the material handling processes during device fabrication. While we now have good contexts that work at uh, 3 to 4 Kelvin, we also need to ensure reproducible ohmic contexts at millikelvin temperatures. And this should be developed in a very scalable way. Now, and when we have succeeded to build the first two cubic gate, hopefully in a few years' time, and we understand by then how to control our qubits, the development of a companion control chip that will be required for further scaling up. So this is a snapshot of the work that we have ahead of us. Now, we anticipate that as each of these next milestones are laid, we would have the opportunities to engage more industry partners and uh, 
these are already some companies we have already begin, begun to engage and uh, work with, and I'm certain there will be more. And finally, let me just quickly acknowledge all the people who have contributed to this work. We pioneered this work of uh, building solid state qubits in Singapore just about four years back, and it has been a very steep learning curve for this team, and this has been our journey. I hope you find this interesting, and it remains for me to thank you for your attention and also to our funders for supporting this work. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Johnson, for a very, very interesting talk. Um, yeah, I suggest uh, we open the uh, session to questions from the audience. Okay, so if nobody uh, has a question yet, so maybe I'll make a start. Uh, so Johnson, your uh, so the observation of Coulomb blockade in, in these material systems, that's that's a very encouraging first step towards towards qubits, obviously. What would you say is sort of the immediate next step uh, from, the, yeah. from the from the many from the many regime to the uh, to the few electron regime, I would say. Right. Um... Thanks, uh, Ben, for that uh, interesting but uh, also difficult question for us. I think uh, this is a, quite a challenging part of this work as uh, far as we understand, it's been challenging for uh, uh, different groups that are trying on these TMDC materials to uh, uh, tune this down to the few um, carriers, all right, few uh, electron regime. Uh, so that is something that we, uh, definitely need to work at uh, immediately uh, now that we have the material. Um, uh, we are still doing some uh, experiments currently uh, as we grow the materials because we need to optimize uh, various aspects of it. Context uh, being one that we have shown uh, good promise with indium alloy. Uh, and so we want to repeat that a couple more times, uh, just to be very sure. But at this point in time, uh, we um, probably, like many other people, are plagued by uh, charge noise that we find that's coming from the substrate and also uh, the effects uh, of uh, the encapsulation by the dielectric. Yeah. So I know many other teams are, or other groups are using HBM to mitigate that. Uh, we're looking at some of those as comparison for our devices. We are largely trying to use uh, uh, deposition techniques like uh, ALD to lay down a dielectric, uh, which could be AL203 or HFO2. Uh, but as we move further, um, we have to start thinking about um, the correct kind of dielectrics as well as, as substrate uh, that we need to use. So we need, I, I think it's quite certain we need to get them um, um, as good as possible in order to reduce um, charge defects uh, or charge disorder they can create for our qubit systems. Um, we think there's a possibility that we would also need to make sure that uh, materials we use for substrate and the gate dielectrics are also largely spin free as well. Um, so those are some uh, considerations that we are flying through now at this point in time. Um, yeah, and amongst that, of course, uh, this uh, issue of uh, can we uh, reduce the uh, number of carriers down to few electron regime. Uh, we're handling uh, yeah, all these things at the same time. But uh, I think uh, we, we are only starting in recent times to get uh, more um, consistent material quality. And so quite a bit of these um, systematic studies still need to be done. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's my phone going off. <laughs> okay, yeah, thanks, thanks, Johnson, for the very comprehensive answer. Um, 
Do we have any uh, questions from the audience? Um, so I got a little bit curious about the uh, signature of resonant tunneling that you showed. I, I somehow missed which kind of device structure that is in and what the resonant tunneling is due to. Ah, okay. So uh, my colleague uh, Aaron did give a rather in-depth talk about that uh, last month, last Tuesday during our quantum webinar. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I think the recording is probably up and so I'd like to refer you to the recording for more details uh, if possible but uh, yes so uh, these uh, devices uh, which are this uh, in this form the TLM structure right uh, that's quite commonly used uh, for initial device um, or material transport characterization to find things like uh, contact resistance. Yeah. So uh, quite commonly used these days. Uh, we also have uh, in recent times started to make this uh, four bar devices as well, but uh, the results are not shown here. So these are TM TRM devices and uh, yeah, we, we find that uh, largely the transport uh, may be described by this uh, variable hopping model. Yeah. And we suspect these uh, resonant tunneling are coming from these uh, um, states. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. so, so they are they are localized states due to, yes. uh, due to states. sort of top grade disorder or that's localized from the shock barriers or uh, do, do you have any indication of that? Mm, at this point in time, we would largely think they are from the disorder, um, charge disorder. Um, yeah. Okay. The other thing I noticed is so they, they're quite periodic in nature, um, but there's definitely no Coulomb blockade involved. Um, sorry again. No, I just noticed those uh, those peaks are periodic in nature, so so there's no uh, Coulomb interaction involved in in those resonant tunneling processes. Uh, okay, for this particular device, uh, it uh, was a bit unfortunate when we uh, uh, wanted to do uh, more detailed conductance uh, spectroscopy on it. Uh, it actually died uh, during one of the cool downs. Uh, but uh, so this device was measured without uh, dielectric capping. And so the intention was to make this device, uh, characterize it first, then we cap it with a dielectric and then characterize it again and then do the full uh, uh, Coulomb blockade uh, spectroscopy uh, or stability measurement uh, eventually. Yeah. But uh, as you know, these devices uh, with multiple uh, cool downs and warming up uh, can potentially suffer this kind of uh, yeah uh, unfortunate accidents uh, due to material mismatch and uh, yeah so um, yeah we, we are making um, new devices and I think the Coulomb blockade uh, measurements that I've shown you just now uh, this one uh, is from a different device a new device and this is a more recent device uh, that worked. Mm. This looks very promising, yeah. So do you have any indication for multiple quantum dots there? Or do you think that's a single quantum dot that is sort of lithographically defined in, by those gates that you, that you pattern on top? OK, so this is a very new data. We are still uh, trying to figure out exactly what we think. Uh, at this point in time, uh, we we're not ruled out a uh, possibility of more than one dot there. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, we, we, we find uh, or we think that we definitely have uh, good evidence of gate control here. Uh, yeah. And so I guess this is uh, something that we um, need to verify um, probably several times. 
again and uh, see this in more than one uh, device. Thanks, Johnson. Yeah, really very encouraging. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Okay, if not, um, uh, I suggest, I, I certainly have more questions, but we can, uh, maybe we can discuss more offline because we're working on related topics. So sure, sure. Um, so yeah, thanks Johnson, once again, for a very, very exciting talk. It's interesting uh, to see how fast this is all moving. Um, yeah, and if there's uh, no more questions, uh, I suggest we can uh, we can finish this uh, this session here. Right. So let's thank this. Okay, thank you.